And for those of you uh, who still are uncertain, undecided as to whether to call in to our psychic advisory hotline, <laughs> perhaps it would comfort you and encourage you to know that some of the entertainment and art world's most illustrious figures have put their future in our hands, in our service. Well, for instance, uh, by the way, uh, Keith Moon. <laughs> and, and do, dead. <laughs> Are you dead? Uh, uh, well, I'd, uh, uh, I'd Leonard Bernstein, John Matusak for <laughs> them too. Well, I guess it's kind of futile for me to mention John Wayne and Samuel Beckett. Then. No. You have to do whatever you think's right then. Ah. In mentioning again civilization and man and all the other things me mentioning seriousness, rigidity, the overlapping, the actual inclusion of man in civilization. And me doing the figure again of like the individual man. And the big box representing civilization itself. And like level of consciousness or it is it's the level of survival, the difference between the cutoff line between what would be the hormones and the neurons. But considering the matter of rigidity, one more time, lifting the line down and considering that in that sense we would have, for literary purposes, a life in common with animals, for instance. Since it's almost impossible for an ordinary person to imagine a human without a functioning intellect. The only thing you'd come up with, you'd probably picture something, a watercolor out of a National Geographic, you know, some guy on the you know, savannas of Africa that you know, looked like either one of our forefathers or else an attorney that just, you know, just missed an ambulance and mad as hell. <laughs> But back to this, do note that from the line down, if we were talking about just survival in us humans, that from here down, we're talking about a system, a structure that is rigid. And if it is not, which I'm now expanding as operationally synonymous with serious, but serious has sounded more as though it were strictly a psychological term, a human emotional term. So let's try rigidity for a while, rigid. From the line down, animals, the animal kingdom, our bodies from here down, just the survival aspect of us, is rigid. There is no flexibility. There is no place for compromise. There is no place for experimentation. There's only places, if it were in an animal, you call it, here's a place for experimentation. You're talking about here's a place for potential suicide. That's all you're talking about. So I mean, that should be obvious enough. From this, this line down, if we're talking about just the physical life of man, to speak of it discreetly. Then from here down, it is rigid. The structure of it, its life, its past, its future, all of its potentials, all of its operations are within a framework of rigidity. Which in this case is synonymous also with health, survival. To leave that and then get to the line above the line that makes us singular into the world of the intellect. Uh, if you gave it a little thought in advance, if I'd prepped you a little bit and you're an ordinary person, then you would think, well, if we're going to continue the conversation, then up here would have to be a different scenario. <laughs> that here would have to be an area wherein man does have some freedom, <coughs> some looseness. Uh, there is some area for experimentation 
and you would almost think that without any analyzation because as fast as you could say that if you're an ordinary person, you would think if it were not for this ability to be non-rigid in the intellect, there would be no progress. Since in the lying down, we do not change. Humans have not made physical, have not been involved in any noticeable physical evolution that's of any importance to a one lifetime. So the progress, the evolution on this planet evidently has been in the singular intellectual realm of man. And you would say well, there has to be then a whole different ball game other besides this rigidity from here down of which I just spoke from here up. It has to be otherwise. It has to be wherewithal, withal. Because, and you just think of all the technological changes, science itself, all sorts of experimentations, how would we have ever come up with the light bulb? They kept trying to burn things inside the house, and they burned down houses, and they tried to make fireproof houses. Now they tried all sorts of things, and it was like the mind, you would think, well, from here up, there is a freedom from this kind of rigidity, or else we would not have progress. There would be no technological advances. Nothing would change. That just seems like a fait accompli. No, no other discussion open except for this. It's not true. I'm sorry. Keith Moon's dead. Well. <laughs> Civilization is, in the sense of a sequen sequential sense, which is what we're stuck with when we're talking with words, civilization is the model for humanity. It is the model. Civilization, being the collective intellectual activity of man, is the paradigm of rigidity. As soon as man begins to talk, let's play this little historical game again. As soon as man, the nervous system gets up to that level and man begins to think and thus talk, civilization, ha civilization has commenced. He immediately begins, civilization does, but he apparently, once men band together and decide that in some way we're going to become a semi-permanent group here together. We're going to live together, be around each other and swap pecans for apples <laughs> and he immediately I mean it just seems obvious that they must come up with certain rules to live by <laughs> the rules are as rigid as a 17 year old kid <laughs> well, you, you can fill in the rest <laughs> locked for two years in a closet by himself <laughs> The rules are rigid, back to that point. Notice, and there is, a, there is an operational significance to this now, so don't just take the first part as being the setup, because there is significance to this. Notice all the rules, from morality to judicial laws, you know, from the secular to the clerical. The man says, all right, they get together. Let's play the historical game right quick again. And they decide, all right, we've got to quit you know, we've been killing each other up until now. You know, every time we turn around and you want somebody else's food, you grab it and kill them. Now, yeah, that's true. You know, or else somebody tries to kill me. So they decide, all right, we've got to stop that. All of the laws are rigid, whether they be secular or clerical, whether they seem to be spiritual or if they just do it on the basis of behavior without any sort of reference to metaphysical forces. Notice, there's, there are no rules like, uh, maybe you shouldn't kill people. I mean, there are none. I mean, there's none like, well, maybe you shouldn't, uh, if you really get mad, maybe you shouldn't kill people. Maybe you should just you know, hurt them real bad. <laughs> but, you know, not killing. You know, so there'd be some give and take, some area that maybe a man would say, well, does that include maybe put out an eye? And so maybe they'd all get together and they'd say, all right, put out an eye, but Try to leave the other guy one eye, because he may have a family, you know, he's got to walk around. How about, what if, what if I break his arm off? 
So the enemy, you understand, it is simply do not do that. Thou shalt not steal. Will it be put in that manner, or whether it's just do not steal. Oklahoma Cave, codified criminal code, volume 17. <laughs> you know. The laws never say, the, moral, the standards of morality, they never say, uh, don't steal, don't steal more than you can use. Or no, don't steal a lot. Of course, that is now over those of you that answered that. That is combining now the secular and the clerical because as soon if Moses or somebody had said, if, if the law had been, don't steal a lot, you would have had immediately one of the first professions an attorney because he'd understand a lot. A lot has got to be adjudicated sooner or later. Someone's got to decide what a lot means. Besides a little <clears throat> judicial humor there is also the point that that is too vague. Uh, any vagueness, by the way, is too vague is what I was pointing out. Just, just note, we don't have to make any more humorous examples. The standards of civilization are rigid. They are not flexible. Now, I know they appear to change slightly, and they do end up in courts and uh, as long as human life is still evolving, then there are continual little changes going on that they will redefine uh, what is thievery. They have to, because now there's intellectual theft possible that was not even possible 10 years ago. There's all sorts of uh, little changes going on, but notice the idea of thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not... Uh, Steal thy neighbor's wife sexually. Thou shalt not kill. They are still rigid. Whether you go by them or not. It's not open to you. You don't say, I didn't kill a guy real bad. It's just, civilization is rigid. Consider that. that back to where I tried to get you to follow me up. Through the first part, that you could, any ordinary person could see that physically, life must be rigid. There cannot be room for experimentation. You just got to know what to eat, how much to sleep, what, under what climactic uh, conditions you should be living, whatever species you are. It's rigid. So you don't have to think about it. You don't have to sit around and think about, should I eat this food? You just know what to eat. You know how much to eat. And from here up, you think, well, it's got to be otherwise. I mean, just obviously it is. It's still rigid. Now, that disregard for a minute, don't get caught up into trying to, because I already did it for you, of saying, well, men do continue to invent things. Yes. But the key word there is invent. They keep making up stuff. No, no, they keep discovering new laws so that they can change technology. Back to civilization, the important aspect. All the light bulbs and computer chip. Technology and advanced mind knows important today. But what is the important aspect of civilization? And that is behavior. It's holding everything together. Civilization is rigid. No one notices that. No one notices it directly. How about all the jokes or items I point out about bad news? How almost all news is bad news. Why? Because what civilization wants man to take note of is where rigidity breaks down. Huh. All right, I'll put it to you. That's the way that ordinary people might want it if they had heard this. If I'd said, well, the reason that uh, apparently all the news, just almost all the news is bad news. And people go, yeah, that's true. Just the news they report. And if I said, well, the reason is because the only news that seems to interest people, or the news that seems to be of primary interest, almost exclusive interest, are instances wherein humans have acted in an uncivilized manner. Which to an ordinary ear, if they didn't know where this was going, they might go, well, that is synonymous. That's all you're saying is bad news is uncivilized news. And they wouldn't take it any further like, well, that is curious. Why is it that we only have an interest in men being uncivilized? The only, or almost the only, 
Again, I'll give you one little way out for your Bobby do Barbie doll brain for the injection mold hole. <laughs> On an hour news show, anything that's not bad news is so. It's such an anomaly, they'll wait to the last 30 seconds and say, hey, wait till you hear this. This is unbelievable. Here is some good news. And if you look down, you think, well, the show's going off in 30 seconds. It's more than an hour or 90 minutes. That's how unusual it is. They just never, and everyone knows it. What is it that civilization, life itself through civilization, is trying to bring to man's attention? It's to make him continually aware of the fact that the potential is there for hormones to overcome neurons. For the rigidity to get too loose. Because what is a loosening of the rigidity of civilization's paradigm? Well, murder, obviously. There's the best one. They go into, they have to dress it up or else it would be the same news every night and the ratings would go nowhere and they couldn't sell any more advertising. But thank God, you know, every day it's like a different person killed. It's not the same guy. It's the same, you know, in the same housing project. You know, it's, it's somebody new gets killed. You know, it's a new way. He gets shot once with a twenty two pistol from, from 50 feet, which is weird because a policeman says, I would not have believed that a twenty two caliber would have killed a man from that distance. And it seems like new news when last night, you know, the same number of people got killed in whatever city you live in. But they have to keep changing it. What is bringing to the attention? Why, bad news. And if I made my comments about most news is bad news, if I made it sound as though it was a critique, and I did it in a more intellectual manner, and I had a, you know, a high school diploma or something to back me up, and I did it seriously, many people go, yeah, that's true. You know, something's wrong with the media. And you know, which is like saying, since some of you seem to have gotten something out of it, it's like blaming television or movies or anybody for violence. Violence on TV, like it's a virus that, you know, that, that came down from a meteor or some you know, evil planet from another solar system to say, we'll teach them a lesson. They sent down violence on TV or violence in paperback books, you know, erotic material in paper. Yeah, just all, they sent it down to teach us a lesson. Like it just, boy, it just sprang from nowhere. <laughs> The new, well, as I was going to say, you could have ordinary, fairly, in fact, sophisticated people. I don't mean ordinary as a backhanded compliment, but sophisticated people say, that's true. Something's wrong. The news is all bad. That's all we get is bad news. It's going to, it's bad enough to t violence on TV. I just got through covering that. Okay, but it's bad enough to violence on TV and the, sh the programs, but then our children are assaulted. And I am. I'm almost insulted. I sit here every night and I watch the news faithfully. And it's nothing but bad news over and over and over. I'm glad you didn't hear what you said. What? <laughs> but anyway, I sit here and I'm sick of it. <laughs> Wait a minute. We'll talk in a minute. I got to tell them the news. They would, I'm sure, blame the media. They'd say, well, there's something wrong afoot. I don't know. it." And they could, well, I've just done part of it for you. That they would probably do. And they'd say, well, even the news departments have now been at least indirectly affected by the uh, careless use of mayhem and violence in the entertainment world and now it's just it's bled over into the the news departments now they're, now they're almost like some sort of entertainment show and it's all bad news that's horrible well we'll talk later here comes the news <laughs> what is going on the point is nobody thinks about it this way especially the news they're, they're, they are beginning to bleed together entertainment and the news but which is just a civilized category it's just changing a felony to a misdemeanor or vice versa <laughs> Letting one prisoner go, and as he leaves, and his wife's out there to meet him, you go, hey, you, come here. And she says, me? Yeah, and you lock her up, which is that's another story, but you can do that one. That one was free, thrown in. The news, the bad news, since all news is bad news, and that's just, you know that's a fact. It's a rule. It is life reminding people, and notice, that, of course, you live in life. It's not like you've got a choice. That you are attuned to it, that you will turn on the bad news, you're just used to it, you accept it, and you could even verbally deny that you enjoy bad news or that you actually watch it. But if you watch any news, you watch bad news because you've got no choice. If you read any news, you read bad news. Well, I don't read the news, all I do is look at the headlines when I walk past the newsstand. Well, it's still bad news. You've never seen headlines that said good news. 
people and life are con or life's making people constantly remind themselves and it's reminding them that all we are is separated by this veneer that at any moment we could be non-rigid that people not rigid enough are shooting one another walking into circle K's and stopping goals and saying give me a pack of Marlboros no by the way give me all your money you got 10 seconds and I'm going to shoot that is not rigid enough people There's another aspect to get down to a personal level. There's, uh, this being a three-dimensional world, by all, ordinary, by all ordinary conscious perception, and being run by polarized energy, it requires rigidity. It requires rigidity in the inter- I've been wanting to do this. In the interpersonal relationships between <laughs> personals. <laughs> so that's what happens when you try to steal some of that material. I forget, what, I forget how psychologists and important, dignified, serious public speakers get out of that. Interpersonal relationships between interpersonals. <laughs> there is a rigidity... <laughs> Well, there is also, for what I was talking about in general, you must see there is a rigidity, uh, not only in the morality of a, any aspect of civilization, no matter what culture. All you've got to do is be civilized, and you've got a rigid code of morality. And all you've got to do is be civilized, and you've got some sort of judicial laws. If you've been civilized, some tribe somewhere, if you've been civilized over all 10 or 20 years, at any rate, you end up also with civil laws. The rigidity, I was going to bleed you a little bit, drift us from there into the very interpersonal relationships between individuals. How about just that which sort of falls between the cracks of laws and uh, religious morality? It's like... Social custom, etiquette, good manners, which sounds pretty nebulous, doesn't it? Even though it may not be supported by threat of punishment by the state or by your local religion, such as uh, you know, burping at the table around other people. Now you can say, well, the, our church, our religion says nothing about that. It doesn't say that the gods will get you. And as far as I know, I've never read the complete code here, but my attorney says that he's never heard of a law backed up by punishment, which is the only law you, that says you can't do that. But we all know, living in this part of the world at least, some of us do, that that is not the polite. I mean, it's just not the thing to do. You do not sit at the table with other human beings, other civilized, shall I say, you just did, people, and even... It's not a display in the Western world that you enjoy the food. You, you turn to the hostess, whoever it was, and you say, my, this is delicious. And then you don't go, burp. <laughs> so we all know that. And it, doesn't, you know, it seems rather meaningless. And before I got, got this specific, you might go, well, if you get outside the areas of laws backed up, civil laws backed up by threat of civil punishment, jail, fines, etc., or even spiritual laws backed up by the threat of punishment by the gods themselves, then anything else is kind of suggestions. Uh uh It's all rigid. Back to this. If you write to uh, whatever her name is, one of these advice columnists, or Miss Manners now, but you know, dear Abigail or whoever it is, and you say, you know, uh, my husband burps at the table, no matter where we are. You know, we're at the governor's mansion for supper. We were with his family. And he, he will burp constantly. What do you say to this? You know, he, he said, I should write to you. They, Ms. Manners or anybody, they do not say, they do not say, well, in polite society, if I must point it out to you verbally, literally, a person who just basically civilized, just minimally decent, doesn't burp a lot at the table. Uh -uh. It says, does not burp at the table. I'm building all this up to see because you do not normally think about it. And, of course, people do not literally live by this. People do burp. People do kill each other. People do steal. They're doing it all the time. 
But notice, the model that civilization has set up, the model that life has made man set up via civilization, in his spiritual laws, his commandments, and in his judicial laws, and in his unwritten modes of civilized behavior, courtesy, etiquette, like I'm mentioning, and all of them is rigidity. There is no wishy-washy. Well, don't kill too many people. You know, don't burp too much. Well, if you're going over the speed limit, don't go real fast. <laughs> it is rigid. The, even though behavior, you could be in any one place and it, you know, life is always itself burping here and there on the planet. And you have areas where warfare breaks out and what is reported to be absolutely uncivil behavior or inside one own culture, one's own neighborhood, down the street somewhere. That there can be uncivil activities going on constantly. Some area where there's always robberies going on or some country right now that they're clashing factions, killing each other and children, un, unsavory behavior. But even though it's going on, notice, civilized people do not take that as any leeway to change the paradigm itself. No one says, well, hey, we're going to kill each other. You know, let's do away with all these laws about thou shalt not kill, which is one of the arguments. Uh, I know it sounds extreme, maybe that one, but that's one of the arguments about drugs. You know, hey, well, you've all heard the story. They've got a logical sequence down of, well, much of our crime is run by off of drug profits and the desire for drugs and et cetera. So if we made drugs, you know, legal, that is, we'd take the rigidity out of, you know, you shall not, you know, have these and this drugs, then it would change the status of people acting in an uncivilized manner. And most of the places in the world don't really want to go for that to any large degree, <laughs> and they don't know why. But if you've been listening, I just told you why. I've been telling you why for the last 15 and 20 minutes, but that's just indirectly. What I want you to see is, no matter that you can get in speed, no matter that you may cheat on your wife or husband, no matter that you may shoplift sometime, that does not change the fact. Because you, if you're civilized, you feel guilty about it. Even if you've never been caught, you feel guilty. And if I made you admit it, and you went, oh, yeah, you're right. I do feel guilty, and I shouldn't. Yeah, you should. You understand? But you might be saying, no, I shouldn't. I'm too hip. I'm too sophisticated. I know that's a kind of throwback to cruder days when we were concerned about morality. And my parents used to say, well, if you steal, God will get you. Or a witch will get you if your family was humanist. <laughs> that you could say, well, that's just a holdover from that. I should have outgrown that. No, you shouldn't. You understand? But you would be saying, many people would say, I'm saying theoretically. They would say, I should be over that. But the fact is, no, you shouldn't. But they would blame it on the environment. They would blame it on their particular culture, their particular environmental upbringing. Well, the only reason I feel guilty about stealing is my parents were just fanatical you know, in their religious beliefs. Or my father was such a wimp. He was, you know, he'd see a cop on the highway and he'd pull over and stop the car. <laughs> he didn't want... You know, you, a man makes some excuse, but that's not it. Life makes you feel guilty. Because guilt is just, it's just an acknowledgement of the rigidity needed to keep whole civilization together. So we've got this rigidity. And we've got that the only thing that amounts to important news. And I, you notice I didn't throw in entertainment about movies and et cetera. I know they have comedies and they have comedy. They still call them comedy shows on TV? Oh, never mind. Far be from it. I was a little humor. Never mind. I know they make you know, <clears throat> humorous movies and etc. But notice, the world's great literature, entertainment, even sports entertainment, is really a form of bad news. Uh, several nights ago, I wrote a news item that I didn't mention, but uh, I said that the final, the supreme review, not criticism, review of city cultural affairs. And it went something like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe it was more like. It said, in the city, entertainment is in the main a celebration of trash and dreams of regression. <laughs> but it was not meant as criticism. We just say, ah, they put out trash. 
they put out trash in the sense I put the two together trash and dreams of regression what are all action movies what are all western movies what are all what's all the heroic literature of hundreds and thousands of years ago of good guys winning out over bad guys it's a celebration of trash that is there is no heroic overcoming by the good guy without what you have to think about it the book has to open the movie has to open with bad people getting the upper hand or else you know the heroes the John Waynes and the Macadamian Nuts or what was his name <laughs> Philip of Macadamia <laughs> I mean they'd be sitting around there for the whole thing <laughs> or Hamlet be sitting around thinking what am I going to do for two hours what am I going to do for five acts you know if they don't go murder his old man I mean, if everything's real nice, maybe the queen just bitches about his father, like, boy, you know, he burps at the table and he won't bathe. I mean, you're going to have Hamlet sitting in a chair on stage, you know, like for five hours, or however long it takes, and then Shakespeare would have had to get a real job, because you know, his plays would have really bombed. The bad guys have to get the upper hand, that's the movies. Even the anti-heroes in history, literature and movies. It is a celebration of trice, this is all one term, celebration of trice and dreams of regression. Because why do you like, if you're an ordinary person, why do you like entertainment? Well, let's just take an average, you know, let's go with a movie. You know, where, you know what action movies they call them, that you know, somebody does something horrible, kills a family, does, blows up an airplane, does something. And then one guy, you know, a John Wayne, a Schwarzenegger, somebody goes, well, wait a minute, you know, enough's enough. <laughs> you know, he straps on his pistols or his ray gun, you know, Buck Roger, whoever it is. But notice, always in the movie, a large part of it, what, first half or more, is the bad people winning. Now, if you're an ordinary person and you were following this and thinking there was real significance, you might go, yeah, but the only reason I stick around is that I want to see good triumph. <laughs> okay, if that be true, but still, if a movie where it lasts, it lasts 90 minutes, how come nobody ever stands up in a theater or even to their own brain and go, why do they, out of a 90-minute film, why is it the first 80 minutes is the bad people winning? Just constantly. And then just the last 10 minutes, goodness prevails. How come somebody doesn't complain? <laughs> when somebody, why don't they even point out and go, well, that's not even a, that's not even a balance. Well, on this day of political correctness, <laughs> you, we, you know, good, good people should at least have, you know, give them half the film. <laughs> and you can say, I don't like it. And I'd say, would you go to a movie? And you'd go, yeah. And I would be polite enough, I wouldn't call you a goddamn liar, but you are. You're an idiot. <laughs> For the same reason that you watch the news. Well, the reason I went through that, that is the celebration, look at this as one, one term, celebration of trash and dreams of regression. Because the first 80 minutes of the bad people winning, that's the celebration of trash and dreams of regression. Now you can say, and it would be true, if movies did not have the final 10 minutes of the good guys winning, the movies would bomb. They'd have a small cult following, but it'd be over, it'd be over in neighborhoods where the, the kind of neighborhoods that people wouldn't pay to get in anyway, so it wouldn't make any money. The kind of people that would like the ones where the good guys never win, they'd just walk into the theater and they'd go, hey, that'll be $5, they'd shoot them. <laughs> so, so the movie, no matter, the, even with a cult following, the movie would never make money because the kind of people that would like that, not going to pay anyway. They'd shoot somebody try to, you know, take up ticket money anyhow. So, entertainment. I was going to throw in, it's not just, not just news, although it's becoming the same, and it always was, but even what seems to be entertainment as separate from the news is a celebration of bad news. Civilization forces it, life forces it for the 10 minutes at the end, the last few pages of the book, for the good guys to win. But up until then, why do you, speaking about you generically, why do you like it? I mean, it can't be a great secret. You'll sit there, if you like that sort of movie, uh, taking it to an extreme, where some bad guy comes into town, he rapes all the women, you know, walks in the bank, just takes money, goes into restaurants there in the little, let's make it a western, make it close the environment real quick, make it easy, eats food and he gets up, in the first you know, few minutes, first times he goes into a place or gets a new saddle or eats some food, somebody says, I'll be $10, and he shoots him. 
You know, that happens at one or two stores, and word gets around real quick. And pretty soon, he's just running, as they like to say in the Western movies, rushod over everyone, just taking what the hell he wants. <laughs> and of course, decent people, if we stopped the movie there in the theater, and I hollered, what if the movie stopped right now? All you people are civilized. Everybody would suddenly try to look civilized. And I'd say, right now, would this movie be satisfying? They would all, in that theater, and look at the theaters representing civilization on this planet. Amos, whatever that means, they would all go, no, 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 we know that, no, it's not going in here, you don't, you don't, you don't mean it's going in here, I'd say, oh, no, I just wanted to check with you, <laughs> Now I could say, well, how do you like it thus far, and let's assume it was well put together and colorful and good dialogue, they go, well, that's pretty good, and I said, wait a minute, <laughs> thus far, it's been nothing but evilness and badness, <laughs> winning, I mean, this guy's just pushing everybody around doing anything he wants to, how can you say you like that, and they go, well, Look, well, we know that he's going to get his. We know that, you know, good will try from the end. Now, you say, well, that may be true. I've admitted it's true, more or less. I've already seen the end of the movie. But how can you say you've been sitting here for X, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, and thus far, bad has triumphed? Incivility. Illegal behavior of the first order. <laughs> you know why? Because it is what people consider entertainment at one level, very important level. That is the celebration of Christ and dreams of regression. That kind of move will admit more than men than women, but you're still subject to it, you women, because hell, you're stuck here and half the planet's made up with the likes of us. <laughs> Plus you couldn't be sweet and break baked brownies and little nippers in your own little oven if it weren't for y'all, assholes like men. Entertainment is in large part. What I want you to see is, we're not talking about entertainment now, of course, we're talking about life, is not only the triumph of good, which is the triumph of civilization, the triumph of rigid behavior at the last 10 minutes, but up until, a, you know, for the first 80 minutes, non-rigidity, uncivil behavior it wins the day. It celebrates regressive behavior, vicariously, surely. But men sit there and... If I turn the house lights, it would immediately go, oh, yes, well, I'm waiting for Clint Eastwood or somebody to show up and you know, right the wrongs of this town and this evil man here and his gang. But for the first 80 minutes, if you had an infrared camera and you looked on these people's faces in the dark, <laughs> as they like to say, I think, psychologically, they're identifying with the villains. They would deny it. They're, they're supposed to. But it is a celebration of trash. Celebration of dreams of regression. The whole idea of being able to go in a store. And you go, I'm hungry. I've been on the trail. You know, give, me a, give me some of those Slim Jims. And the storekeeper hands it to you and says, that'll be $2. And you know they're only worth 50 cents. And you realize, is this the only store in town? And the guy goes, what do you think? And you realize, that's what, where's the nearest town? And the shopkeeper goes, 200 miles? In other words, you realize, I'm getting ripped. Huh? Because he can go, he's already given you the message, I can charge anything I want to. And the dreams of regression. The villain picks it up, eats it, begins eating it, and the storekeeper says, well, where's my $5? He says, you ignorant little small town son of a bitch, here's your $5. And he just takes the butt of his gun and just splits his head open. And walks out. Now, anyone who thinks that that is not entertainment, <laughs> well, you fall into one of several possible classifications. You are you are living in an you're living in an irreversible trance, a daze, or else you're so overly civilized that you know don't get near anyone who has diabetes. <laughs> At least you make us sick. It is. That is entertainment. Now it has to have the payoff. And that is part of civilization's job is to always have what seems to be at least the threat of a payoff. That this guy keeps getting arrested. They let him out. They say the prisoners are too full. He holds, you know, he holds up a store and he shoots somebody. And you find out he gets arrested two weeks later. And the news reports, and they, God, this is horrible. We've got to do something. 
they keep reporting it and you keep watching it and you may not along if you're ordinary speaking generically God this is horrible you go we got to do something the rigidity is still there in that you believe something must be done you believe that something eventually will be done and at the end of the news show it's like that you know it goes off at six o'clock that's like the threat of hell or heaven that there seems to be a finality to it I admit this gets a bit probably metaphysical for embalmers and attorneys <laughs> taxi drivers <laughs> ad men plumbers <laughs> But the point, the point is of, them, of their being this, of civilization being cut up into discrete packets, even, te even temporally speaking, that the news actually goes off, that you know for a fact, if you're watching the, you know, the local news, you know it runs from whatever it is, 5 until 6.30, and it's nothing but an hour and a half of bad news and commercials, which it's according to how intelligent, intelligent you are to realize that there's a very slim distinction. But... <laughs> I had to slip that in. Life made me do it. There is almost a rigidity. There is almost the promise, the fulfillment of the promise of retribution, or at least some kind of finality, that the news finally goes off. This is the point I said I admit it was a bit metaphysical for most people, which I wasn't going to lay on it. But you understand, it's like 90 minutes of bad news, and you could be sitting there going, Jesus, the world is worse. It gets worse every day. And then they, the same people keep getting arrested. The judicial system falling apart. Our country has no sense of morality. This is horrible. And you glance up and they say, you know, the anchor team gets right at the end and they start making little casual jokes like, well, and maybe the weatherman walks up and they go, well, at least, you know, in spite of all this and the plagues and all this, at least, you know, old Bobby boy here said that tomorrow's going to be bright and sunny. And he said, yeah, it will. And they make some little joke together and say, well, until tomorrow. And that's almost, knowing that the news is going off, like, well, I don't have to hear more of this shit. It's almost as though things have been righted. At least there's an end to it. Like, well, Jesus, you know, at least I won't have to hear it until the 11 o'clock news. <laughs> the rigidity, I was going to try and tell you something or suggest to you something that could be useful. I will have to make one of those quantum steps myself without trying to segue in. All right, I'm segueing in. Okay, <laughs> that's over with. There is a kind of rigidity that is also the norm that is required because of the transfer of energy, verbal and otherwise, between individuals. Hmm. How about just in the normal course of social conversation? Here's the way it goes. And no one notices it, for any, not for the reason I'm going to point out. If anybody takes notice, it's on some pathological basis to try and slip in a textbook on psychology. But two people are talking. And one guy, they just, they met, they're just becoming friends or acquaintances. One of them says something about, uh, well, I just got back from Tahoe. But, you know, boy, I really enjoy getting out there, there in Vegas sometimes. Uh, do you like to gamble? And let's say, and I'm playing this guy. And you go, ah, no, nah, I don't, no. Nah. I, I just never got into it. No, we're all used to that. Or you can say, uh, boy, I went to the greatest concert last night. Uh, you, does music mean as much to you as it does to me? And you go, no, I, don't, I never cared much for music. <laughs> it just seemed like nothing going on. But notice, there is a rigidity to the dance that individuals do, even verbally, at a level that appears to be meaningless. <laughs> Such as examples I just made up. What could be more meaningless than that? Because I'm not suggesting, I'm not going further that they're about to get in a fight and the first guy go, what do you mean you don't like gambling? What's that, are you a communist? It just seems to be almost nothing. Let's, it's a social, friendly conversation. Let me put this rhetorical question and then try and show you that it has some possible usefulness. Why do you not, you generically again, that somebody's talking to you? And they say, uh, I don't know, just Vegas, I, I just love going out there, the whole, I, I, just gambling's always been, I guess, one of my hobbies, you know, not enough to hurt me. Do you like gambling? And let's say that you've got no particular feeling either way or the other. Why does not a man ordinarily, you're trying to be friendly, it's just somebody you've met, or maybe somebody you've known for a while, and they just, the subject never came, they say, well, how about you, you like gambling? And you realize they don't even care, they're on their own talk about it, you know, he's talking about, and he just kind of looks at you, even like, well, how about you? 
How come you don't nod and just kind of, hey, you know, or say, yeah, me too, that's me. It really is. So if the guy continue on, he's going to continue on anyway. Why do you stop and get rigid? Which is what you're doing. You understand? You could be tone deaf, but the guy says, oh, by the way, uh, yo, yo, ma was in town last night. Bernstein didn't show up, however. <laughs> oh, that's right, they told me about that. <laughs> Of course, this could be, now might be the time for him to use our psychic hotline. <laughs> Don't call collect, though. Lenny, I told you about that. <laughs> Somebody you know, friendly conversation, and they say, God, I love you. I don't know. And they did a, uh, they were doing an all Tchaikovsky program last night. Uh, boy, music, I don't know. Music's really great, isn't it? And he just kind of looks at you, and you say, Oh, I don't you know. Music to me, I can't tell one from the other. And the conversation goes on. Nobody notices it. But again, I ask you, let's say it's a friendly conversation. You weren't trying to prove anything. You don't even think about it. No one does. And an ordinary person, if they were listening to this, they could say, well, I'm trying to be truthful. Good <laughs> God, you know. You live in a duck world. Ordinary people. Well, I just tried to tell the truth. Uh, music to me, just noise. I don't like music. The stuffiness, and I'll go down there and have to pay money to listen to people play instrument. <laughs> I know all that, but it's a friendly conversation. The person, the person didn't say, if you like music and you admit it, I'm going to pull out a gun and make you go to the next con. The person just talking. You know, I, I like gambling. I like, do you ever go to basketball? You know, the Hawks are doing real good this year. Uh, do, you, do you get to many of the games? And you go, God, I, I never could get into basketball. And go, go, well, at any rate, you'll, you'll see what the Hawks. And the guy, conversation keeps going. Why do you stop and get rigid? Well, that's to help keep society alive, to help keep life alive. But consider, why? <laughs> Let me change the scene a little bit. Getting, easing up on the potential practical application. Uh... Start to use a, key, a ski resort and an electronic starting fireplace. <laughs> Either that or put a new CD player in your car. Let's see. All right, how about you're at a ski lodge? And uh, part of the sales thing is they have this big fancy fireplace, but it has some kind of you know, fancy electronic starter thing. But it's a real fireplace, but it's no... So you get there. And you go inside and you go there and uh, you don't even see any wood. There's some, some sticks and some you know, newspapers or something. You throw a magazine in there and you try to mash a button. It's got a list of instructions there next to the fireplace like this. A little bitty print and you look at it. You've been driving all night. I'm giving you all kinds of excuses. It's real expensive. You go there and you pick up the phone, call the desk. And you say, God damn, what the hell's wrong with this damn fireplace? And you're charging me X amount of it. Rigidity. How come people never do this? Why don't they call the desk and instead of registering complaints immediately? We're not saying the complaint is not valid. Instead of registering a complaint, why not get the person by, by asking non-aggressive questions, which I'm going to show you if you can't jump ahead. You can get people involved in a participatory assistance to you. That rather than making an attack, which is a form of push-pull, it is a form of polarized confrontation. It is a form of, what's the word I'm looking for? Starts with an R. Rigidity. Oh, yes. Instead of that, why well, is more rigid? They say, desk, and you say, God damn, this is room so-and-so, chalet number so-and-so. What the hell's going on with this fireplace? I paid 50 extra dollars. You told me there's no problem with this fireplace. Now, you may eventually get it fixed, and et cetera, which is not the point. No. Yeah. But I'm asking you, why the absolute immediate rigidity of, hey, this is me, and things are not going right, and it's your fault? Somebody answer to this. <laughs> this is the same thing as, would you like to gamble? Do you like music? Why not, when I was saying if you can get people involved, if you ask enough questions, and it doesn't take to eternity, you can get people involved with a kind of participatory assistance to you. It's like saying, uh, what do I do to get the electronic started? 
Let's say by then you've already gotten the hot tub and you've got the phone over there. And he says, well, you do so-and-so. Did you mice the green button? It's right up under the mantelpiece. you got to hold the red one, then mice the green one. Well, I didn't see the green one. And plus, I didn't see any wood. Well, it's right out below the window on the left side of the chalet. Well, maybe the snow covered up. I didn't see any. Well, did you have anything to bring it in? Is it real heavy? I've had a back problem. You can keep talking. Trust me, not me. We're running out of time. If you do it, and it's no big trick, if you're non aggressive and non rigid, it's very easy, very potentially possible within a short period of time, someone from the office will be over there and do it for you <laughs> with never a cross word coming out of your mouth. That it's just, all right, now wait, I mice the green button under the mantle. No, it's the red button under the, that's the one showing, right? I'm not staying at the fireplace right now. I was over here trying to make this uh, hot tub work. It seems to be a little trouble. But one thing at a time. <laughs> And you say, so I'm ice the red button and then the green button. Would I hold the green button while I'm ice the red one? Or did you say hold the, re hold the red one while I'm ice the green one? I don't Sometimes I'm not good. Hold, the, hold them both? Wait, wait a minute. All right, all right. Well, wait. Well, I should already have wood in the fireplace, right, before I even do that. And you said the wood. Are you sure that's out there? I mean, the snow's covered it. I'm not doubting that you meant to have some. But, you know, there's so much snow out there. When I was driving up, I was on the left side of the cabin. I didn't notice it. Are you sure it's out there? Just a little more of this. <laughs> and somebody will be over there. And I don't mean hostily that they'll be over there in a real begrudging manner. But someone will end up over there doing it for you. They'll call it assisting. Or, well, let me send over the, the boy and he'll show you how to do it. And then you can do it for yourself next time. And now you're sitting in the pool and you say, okay, that'd be real neat. Yeah. <laughs> it requires... if you'll still accept the terms I was using, that you not immediately engage in the kind of rigid behavior, though it's not classified or analyzed in that manner, that I've tried to use two examples that seem far removed. If you started and did not follow a rigid pattern that seems acceptable, that seems a norm that you do not even think about, the whole situation will shift then what I was going to suggest to you is what if you took this non-accusatory manner, which uh, I assume some of you put together, like my first example of man saying, would you like, you know, boy, I enjoy gambling. How about you? you know, I enjoy going to a good concert. Even though I said that was a friendly conversation between two acquaintances. It's not a stranger who has paid big bucks staying overnight in a stranger's resort calling the desk. So you might think it's two different things, but it's not. There's the same kind of rigidity and a kind of non-hostile, it appears in the first example, confrontation, the person just is saying in the course of conversation how much they enjoyed their last weekend at Tahoe and how much they enjoyed gambling. You know, how about you? I never asked you, do you like to gamble? And you go, ah, I don't know, I never, I, don't, I never liked it. That is a rigid confrontation. It is the denial, it is a lack of agreement. You're not participating in a positive manner. You're not supposed to. But I was asking you, why, why wouldn't you? Why do you never even think about it? Especially if it's somebody that you know. Why not just go along and say, God, I, you know, boy, I love a good concert. Tell me about it. He's wanting to anyway. He brought it up. Why not? Why not? Instead of, hey, you told me that this CD, I mean, this uh, stereo system, you just put my car, you remember me? I was just up there two weeks ago, and you told me that plug right in, I could put in an outboard CD player. Well, goddamn, I've, I've been out there. I've almost driven myself crazy. I wasted half of my Saturday. I work all week. I'm not joking. Boy, you don't know what kind of problems I've had with this. No, you're prone to have. But if you start asking, it's very likely the guy said, well, look, if you do the same kind of thing I was saying about the fireplace for the front desk at the resort, it's very likely the guy said, well, are you close by? You know, well, why don't you just bring it on up here? And you're up there, and you yeah, well, have a coat. The sun gun, they'll take it in the back and somebody will put it together for you. There is the same kind of rigid confrontational attitude <coughs> because that's what it takes to prop up an imaginary function like civilization or a man's <laughs> intellectual personality. They both are imaginary, they're both invented. <laughs> civilization is just as phony, just as unreal, unauthentic, unstable. 
Well, when you've said imaginary, you've said it all. I don't know why I keep searching for more synonym. It is just as unreal as the participants therein. It's inhabitants. The city is unreal. But it's no more unreal than the inhabitants. Because, in fact, it is the model for the inhabitants. They just don't realize it. That's who they are patterning themselves after. In that same way, a man's attitude toward his mind is why I keep bringing up all these Sometimes I know they appear to be ridiculous or non-sequitorial stories about a man talking to his mind and saying this and that to his mind. His mind says something back. And ordinary sane people wouldn't put up with that kind of stuff. They'd go, what kind of crap is that? You know, that doesn't go on. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but there is that kind of rigid confrontation between a person and their mind. It's known to look down the basis, well, I'm only doing the same, th same thing. I'm only doing that which is reasonable. <laughs> what they really do is just do what they do from habit, and they don't even think about it. And if you ask them, they go, oh, that's ridiculous. Or I do it because, well, I thought about it, and that was the intelligent thing to think. Yes. There is a rigid confrontation that goes on. It is a hostile, in the sense, a comparative sense. It is a hostile calling up of the desk about, this damn fireplace doesn't work. Now, it's not necessarily you talking to you about you, but it's you watching the news and going, what the hell? You mean they have voted part of the communist, the old communist party back? Now that they got free elections, back into power in Hungary? I got relatives in Hungary. What the world? Jesus. This guy has just shot and killed another person, and the news just said they let him out of jail two weeks ago on a $50 bond. <laughs> and he just got through shooting somebody my god how come this fireplace won't light <laughs> <laughs> there's a way to be non-aggressive non-rigid in a kind of questioning to the point of getting an unusual an unnecessary kind of participatory assistance by what seems to be your own mind that you're not used to but there's one thing, one description that since we're out of tape anyway, I'll just leave it at, that will not work, that will bar any possibility of that, and that is being rigid from here up. Except being rigid from here up for an ordinary person is the only thing that keeps them upright. It's the only thing that keeps them sane. It's they have to, the same way, it's the only thing that holds civilization together. It has to be rigid like, you shall not kill. Don't give me this shit about you won't kill too many people. You won't kill. You won't steal. You won't do this and that. That is the model for civilization. A person's mind, as they like to call it sometimes, their personality, is just as rigid. And to them, it has to be. You know, when you go to work every day, you say hello to the boss. You dress with a suit and tie. You don't go in sometimes in the morning and go, hey, 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 hello, boss, hey, hey. You know, do Daffy Duck or something. <laughs> well, even if you only do it on Tuesdays once a month. Uh -uh. So you have, to, you have to be rigid. And you can't get up and watch the news and, you know, the, who, you know if it's a Democrat's the president and he comes and makes a speech and you go, Jesus, you know, the Democrats are going to tax us to death. And then that's the 6 o'clock news. And then 11 o'clock news, the president comes on, they're reshowing basically the same thing. And you go, boy, thank God the Democrats are back in. <laughs> you understand? If you tried to point that out as, as some possible example to an ordinary person, they'd go, you know, you're nuts. And if I tried to do that, I'd be nuts. Yeah. But there's a way to be flexible, and it is a non-confrontational accuser, and it lacks any accusation because it is not rigid between a man and what seems to be the thoughts going by. The rigidity is fly paper. Because the flies are there anyway. And rigidity is, come here you. Yeah you. I don't like you. It doesn't matter which fly it is. You can like them or not like them. But what you got to do is capture them. You got to be rigid about it. Either, all right, all right, some of you can keep going. But you stop. It's all the same thing. Don't be rigid. If you know how. <laughs> Where would Schoenberg been when they said, hey, that the, that's not harmony? And he thought about it, and to his critics went, <laughs> well, he did worse than that. He said, you don't like that? He said, try this.